Okay, welcome everybody. Um, our speaker today is Dr. May Musier, and May and I first met through our mutual love of the ancient Greek novels. Um, May has completed her PhD on the representation of Persians in the ancient Greek novel. She is a trustee of the Classics for All charity and also the Society for the Promotion of Roman Studies. And she has co-edited Forward with Classics. I should have got my copy out. It's up in the bookshelves there. A book which explores the ways in which classical languages are considered valuable in the 21st century. And I hope you all agree with me that they're very valuable. Um, during her time at Oxford University, May held a variety of roles, including Classics Outreach Officer for the Faculty of Classics and Public Engagement Manager for the Bodleian Libraries and May is currently working in public engagement and heritage at Swansea University. I was particularly interested to hear about May's work on the Ge'ez texts. These are ancient biblical texts from Ethiopia and Eritrea, and I'm delighted that May has accepted the invitation to tell us more about these. So over to you, May. Well, fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Helen. Um, I suppose the first thing is to um, help me share my screen in terms of the presentation. So uh, whilst you're doing that, Helen, I just want to say thank you um, to, to you and the rest of your staff who invited me uh, to give a talk. Um, this is a talk which I initially gave at Harvard um, this is a research area which a colleague of mine, um, Professor Judith McKenzie, uh, who passed away a couple a few years ago, um, she's the professor of late antiquity, and we had a mutual interest uh, in Ethiopian and Eritrean um, studies. Um, for me, it was from a very personal uh, motivation rather than a particular research. As a researcher, uh, my field is more of a classical rather than late antiquity. Um, as a someone from an Eritrean background with Ethiopian roots, um, this was particularly interesting. Um, and someone who is from the diaspora communities um, and some of the manuscripts being held in European and US um, universities, we, this was of, of a enlightening, illuminating, shall I say, experience. So a bit of this is really my experience of um, perhaps putting on some public engagement activities in the classics faculty and beyond, as well as interacting with Bodleian libraries on their, uh, the, the collected manuscript in their possessions. Um, and I suppose connecting the modern Ethiopian Eritrean diaspora of the UK with the ancient manuscripts as well as public institutions like Oxford University. So I suppose I come at it from a, a variety of perspective um, and I hope that you find it as interesting as I've found the experience. Um, I've certainly learned a lot and I hope that um, you come away <laughs> enlightened, <laughs> if that's the word. Um, so without further uh, ado, I'm going to share my presentation so you can see. I hope you can see that. Not if you can. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. Uh, right, so let me just put that in as a slideshow. Right. Honestly, you, you, we do these for the past God knows, however many years, we should become accustomed to it, right? Oh, there we are. Is that all right? Yep. Excellent. And I'll just move that up there. So as a homage, really, to Judith McKenzie, um, because this is, was part of her work, and she, had, she spent um, many years, uh, myself and her, um, nurturing this really um, profound relationship um, and so I'm very grateful to her to be a mentor to me and guide me really to, I suppose, tap into my own 
heritage, which I ignored for a very long time, living in this sort of limbo between two communities, um, the British community and the Eritrean communities. So I've still got her name on there because it is very much part of her work, but also a homage. So in the time today, I will present the main findings of the work of Professor Judith McKenzie on the Garima Goth Girls, uh, which is published in her and Francis Watson's book, which you will see um, later on. I will briefly introduce the Garima Gospels, then touch on what they have in common with other illuminated gospel books elsewhere, and what is dis distinctively Ethiopian about them. So when we talk about Ethiopia, um, as Helen will know, uh, as a classicist, it's, a, it's a slightly, sorry, I'm just getting a little bit of echo. So I'm just wondering um, if, if anyone's moving around. <laughs> if you haven't muted your, your mic, that might be better. It's slightly distracting. <laughs> Helen, are you getting that echo? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting a noise uh, just from like someone's microphone, but May, I think you can mute everybody from, from the menu. Oh, I think it's gone now, but thank you. <laughs> it's gone now. Yes, uh, so the term Ethiopia um, is slightly, there's ancient Ethiopia, there's modern Ethiopia, uh, and neither shall the twain meet. Um, Ethiopian ancient times is often uh, associated with Nubia, so we're not really thinking about Ethiopia as in the modern sense. Uh, in terms of the gospels that I will be talking about today, Ethiopia, it um, encompasses the land between Ethiopia and Eritrea and Eritrea was part of Ethiopia until the early 90s when it gained its independence. So when I talk about Ethiopia, please do bear in mind there are um, sort of um, geographical and, uh, you know, sort of um, issues with that, with that name, but also that it represents Ethiopia and Eritrea. So, the Garima Gospels are three illuminated four gospel books which had survived in the Abba Garima Monastery in the Ethiopian Highlands. It is virtually impossible to gain access to the Garima Gospels. And as the illuminated pages had never all been published in color prior to our book, scholars had been unable to study them. Because of Professor Michael Gervais, who is a late antiquity and medieval professor in um, Toronto University, um, had photographed them in 2000 to 2005 before the 2006 repairs, we were able to study and publish all of the illuminated pages in their pre-restoration state. When the pages were also out of sequence, Hopefully, this will lead to a fuller recognition of their importance and finally stimulate the attention that they deserve. A further recent development is that the Hill Museum and Manuscript, Manuscript Library in the US has put the two more ornate repaired volumes online if you have uh, an account you can access them. When the English artist Beatrice Plain saw the Garima Gospels in 1948, marking their rediscovery by Europeans, they were brought out of the monastery for her to view. Although she recognized their relationship to the sixth century Syriac Rabula Gospels, which we will see shortly, the importance of the Garima Gospels was not appreciated by later scholars because they assumed they dated to the 10th or 11th century admit someone. However, radiocarbon readings in 1999 and 2012, organized by Jacques Messier and the London-based Ethiopian Heritage Fund, dated parchment from the two Garima volumes seen here to AD 330660. When combined with Mackenzie and Watson's studies of the illuminations and the text, it is clear that they are of a similar date to the parchment 
which makes them particularly important because so few illuminated gospel books have survived from this period. There we go. So you can see Michael Gervais there talking with the priests and looking at the Garima Gospels there. And you can see, it's really nice to see the Lindisfarne Gospels and the Book of Kells against the Abba Garima. So you can see the similarities of the difference there. We can appreciate quite how early the Garima Gospels are if we remember that two of the most early gospel books in Britain the Lindisfarne Gospels and the Books of Kells were not made until the 8th century. Like luxury gospel books throughout Christendom, they have the numbered concordance to the gospel text at the front called canon tables, as well as portraits of the evangelists. Because the Grima Gospels are even earlier, they can provide an indication of earlier lost luxury gospel books, especially those from the Eastern Mediterranean. The only other early reliably dated illustrated gospel book surviving in the East is the Syriac Rabula Gospels of 586. I mentioned the Grima Gospels are the equivalent of more Rabula or Lindisfarne Gospels in terms of their importance as a source of information about late antiquity. I'll just admit someone. About late antique art and illuminated gospel books. As the earliest surviving Ethiopian gospel books, they are also important for what they show about the development of distinctively Ethiopian luxury gospel books and, and art, which also have features in common, examples elsewhere in the East. They merit being appreciated in the wider context of the late antique world and art, and not only within Ethiopian and Eritrean studies. about the map there. As we see here, the inaccessible monasteries in the highlands of Ethiopia provide, oh, sorry, I've just skipped a, a line there. The Grima Monastery is located in the highlands of northern Ethiopia. So you can see the arrow pointing to Aksum there. And this is the road to Abba Grima Monastery. We'll just go back to that for a moment. The area of the Aksumite Empire with its equal in Aksum, and that's its capital there, Aksum there, covered much of the area of modern Ethiopia and Eritrea from the first to eighth century AD. So as you can see, Ethiopia is <laughs> um, much larger than just Ethiopia you know now, it encompasses Eritrea too. The term Ethiopia here is used to refer to the whole of that area. The gospel texts were translated in the fifth century from Greek into Giz, which is still the liturgical language of the Ethiopian and Eritrean Orthodox churches. As we, as we see here, the inaccessible monasteries in the highlands of Ethiopia provided safe places for the preservation of texts which did not survive elsewhere, such as the monastery of Abba Garima. Now I went there, um, I think 20, 18 for the first time and it, it's really high up in the highlands uh i'm not gonna kid you with a rickety old bus um and um you know it's just sort of hardly anyone there except to one priest and um i was able to get to the to the museum but not necessarily the the uh the monastery and you can see why that they would wouldn't admit women into the monastery. <laughs> right, so um, just introducing the illuminated um, uh, pages, the illuminated pages from the front of uh, Abba Garima uh, 3 are placed in order here. Sorry for the missing pages, it's just the images um, were far too, too much to um, transfer over to the presentation. The canon tables function as a concordance of passages covering the same events or material in the different gospel books. 
the passages, the passages are identified by marginal numbers in the text. How these tables worked is explained by their inventor, the famous third, fourth century historian and Bishop Asabus of Caesarea in his letter, which precedes them. In Abba Garima III, they are followed by the Jerusalem temple image. Abba Garima III is dated by three carbon 14 readings to AD 330 to 650. If textual evidence is taken into account, then the first of these dates can be narrowed from 3302, circa around 480, given a date of around about 480 to 650. It is the earliest surviving gospel book anywhere with an author portrait of each evangelist as a front piece to his gospel. These are the illuminated pages of Abba Garima 1. So you can see there. The letter of Isibis precedes the canon tables, which are followed by an empty frame and a circular pavilion. It does not have author portraits. Abba Garima 1 is dated to AD 530 to 660, based on a single carbon 14 reading. As we saw, they include the circular pavilion after the canon table where there is a temple image in Abba Garima uh, 3. We will return to these images which are unique for that period. The third Garima gospel is Abba Garima 2, not to be confused. <laughs> it is later and was not tested for its carbon 14 date, but it is the third oldest Ethiopic gospel book. Its text is based on a later version than the other two Garima gospels. Obviously, the dates could be considerably narrowed with radiocarbon testing of more samples. Virtually all illuminated gospel books in the East and West originally had canon tables. The Grima 1 and 3 frames are important because they are the earliest surviving sets of frames based on Greek prototypes. Norden Falk's 1938 study of the origins of canon tables concentrated on the frames, not the numbers. Despite the strong architectural component in their designs, canon table frames have never been studied by an architectural historian such as uh, Judith McKenzie, nor have the canon tables been studied for their content as Francis Watson has done. The earliest illuminated canon tables were thought to be framed by a series of arcades as in the 6th to 7th century fragmentary Greek examples. However, the Grima Gospels, which are earlier, have solid headpieces, suggesting that by the late 5th or 6th century, both forms have developed. Both arcades and headpieces are used on later Georgian frames, such as the 9th century Adishi and the 10th century Harvard Bertei Gospels, which is here in Harvard, but not well known. Both forms are also used on the 10th century Armenian Etchmetzin Gospels. The Grima headpieces have details in common with those on other Eastern canon tables, such as the Syriac Rabula Gospels, which were written and painted in 586 in a monastery in northwest Syria near Antioch, which is modern day Antakya. Although Syriac canon tables have very narrow columns and are distributed over many more pages than the 10 pages of the first millennium examples based on Greek prototypes. There are also similarities between the Rabula and Garima frames in the decorative elements of the headpieces with just a couple of examples presented here. This suggests that they had a common origin in an earlier period from which examples have not survived. The Grima Gospels also have similar details to those on other later frames based on Greek prototypes. For example, in the top Garima frame, the shaded blue band frees the geometric semicircular panel and the facing peacocks on the first page of the letter of Isibis are similar to those on the Armenian Etchmetzin Gospels of AD 989 in the center and the 9th century Greek examples in Venice on the left. 
On the lower Garima example, the frame has an interlocked key pattern facing doves and red semicircles in common with frames on the Etchmades and Gospels. The similarities are striking despite the approximately five century gap between them and the distance. On this map, we can gain a sense of their location. Now to discuss the Ethiopian fe features about these manuscripts, the Grima frames also have some specifically Aksumite or Ethiopian detail, which as we will see, suggests that they were made in Ethiopia, contrary to what most Western scholars have assumed, although it might not surprise an audience such as this possibly. The Grima frames have a garden with plants and birds along their tops. The 14 types of birds are identified by ornithologist Linda McKayley, include not only guinea fowl native to Africa, but in particular crowned eagles on Abba Grima tree, which are only found in the wild in Africa, in Ethiopia and further south. Capitals on Abba Grima 1 are Corinthian, but the type of Corinthian Mackenzie found is specifically Aksumite. Whilst there are late antique pilaster capitals elsewhere with three leaves, such as at Laxor in Egypt, it is only on Aksumite examples that the three leaves curl back on each, forming a circle between them, as on this example on the top right which is found at the site of the Cathedral of uh, Merit Zion in Aksum. So the capitals on Abba Grima 1 are specifically Aksumite. The capitals on Abba Grima 3 are based on quite different real prototypes, notably close to Egyptian examples. They have two rows of leaves on them with no volutes, like this one from the main church at Saqqara near Cairo. Thus, both the birds on the Abba Garima 3 frames and the capitals on the Abba Garima 1 frames indicate that these frames were painted by artists of a knowledge of Ethiopian architecture and wildlife. Mackenzie found the illuminations of Abba Garima 3 were painted by a single artist, whereas those of Abba Garima 1 were painted by more than one artist. There is no overlap of the specific patterns between the two um, codices indicating the artists trained in two different schools. Furthermore, although the frames of Abba Grima II are simpler, they belong to a third school which goes back to a third late antique prototype with details in common with the Rabula Gospels but not with Abba Grima I or Abba Grima III. This makes the Abba Grima II frames important despite their style. This evidence for three separate schools means that there must have been an extensive local tradition of gospel book decorations in Ethiopia, which was already well developed by the time the Grima Gospels were painted, i.e. the Grima Gospels are an indication of earlier lost gospel books and not the earliest. Additionally, despite a gap of over half a millennium, contrary to what some scholars have assumed, later Ethiopian frames do have details on them from the tradition of both Abba Grima 1 and 3 together on the same manuscript, such as the 13th century example, suggesting the strength of the local tradition they represent. Just moving over to the Jerusalem temple image now. After the canon tables, Abba Grima III has an image which can be identified as a Jerusalem temple with features of Solomon's and of Ezekiel's temple. Some architectural details on the Grima temple images are significant because they are characteristic of Aksumite architecture and not found elsewhere. The most obvious features are the window types, the arced windows along the top with stepped capitals and bases, as well as the square ones with thick frames divided by a cross position partway up the walls are observed on the stele carved at Aksum before the fourth century and surviving in later built and rock cut architecture as we see here. The bases of the columns on the temple images are notable because they do not have the curved profile of 
Roman ones used on the canon tables, but rather are stepped like Aksumite built uh, temples. When we were researching the book, we thought there was no parallels for the Grima depiction of the temple in other late antique art. However, Christian Sahna pointed out the image of the temple in the Book of Kells, where Christ is tested on the pinnacle of the temple. You can see here the similar shape and proportions of the building, but the details are completely different, reflecting two different cultures at opposite ends of Christendom. That they have an image in common is not totally surprising if we remember that both also share evangelist portraits, gospel texts and canon tables, although in different languages. Instead of the temple after the canon tables, Abagrima I has a distinctive form of circular building or tholos with a tent roof. This form first survives in the first century BC and AD in pagan architecture influenced by Ptolemaic Alexandria, such as a rock cut casnet at Petra and depicted in Pompeian wall painting. This is also how Mackenzie came to study the Grima illuminations when she's known better for her works on Petra and Alexandria. So we all think, you know, fall into things by accident sometimes. A millennium later, we see the Tholos in the 10th century Armenian gospel books, which have a striking similarities in the colors used with those in the wall paintings. In the Christian examples, the Liden urn on the Corinthian capital is replaced by an orb and cross. The Eastern Christian examples often have a tree on either side and continue the garden imagery with flowers and birds on the Tholos roof. By contrast, um, Carolingian examples in the West and Greek one here lack the plants growing out of the roof. These differences suggest that these Tholoi were derived from a common source before the Eastern ones were given elements of a garden and a different interpretation. Ethiopia is the only place where the circular pavilion continues to be depicted in the uh, gospel books after the 11th century. The later Ethiopian examples like the canon table frames are derived from a variety of earlier prototypes. Later examples such as these in New York also provide keys to the meaning of the tholos. They usually have a tree on either side, which is labeled tree of paradise, suggesting the garden rep represents paradise i.e. the Garden of Eden. The antelope box on either side could also be an allusion to the deer drinking at the Fountain of Life, like in earlier Christian mosaics. Armenian texts of the 8th and 12th centuries, which explain the meaning of canon table decorations with similar gardens, birds and flowers on top of them, suggest this decoration alludes to the Garden of Paradise. Between the center columns and many of the later Ethiopian tholoi, such as the two on the left, there's an inscription. Arrangement of the table of how the words of the gospels agree or a shortened version of this. This eludes the preface to the canon tables, part of which survives in Abba Agreement 3. The tholoi could represent the harmony of the gospels, but they could also have had other meanings, making the, bi making the tholos an iconic image, encapsulating or combining various aspects which are too complex to go into here properly. As I mentioned, Abba Grimat III is the earliest gospel book with a complete set of author portraits of the evangelists as a front um, piece to their specific gospel. Abba Grimat III has five portraits, but because there are four evangelists, there has been confusion over their identities. The fifth portrait, is not an evangelist, contrary to what other scholars have uh, assumed. Unlike the evangelist, this figure is not standing on a pedestal or holding a gospel book, but a book with a parallel lines in it. We find the key to his location in the gospel book is provided by the text on the other side of the folio. It is the last page of the prefatory text on the agreement of the words of the four holy gospels, which, are, which would have gone before the letter of is Isabus. Francis Watson suggests that this is a portrait of Isabus himself.
The attire of the standing Garima evangelists is close to that depicted in late antique art from Egypt, as in the sixth century Alexandrian world chronicle here, and the cover of the Freer Gospels. The portrait of Mark seated wears a bishop's white scarlet Virgil. The choice of a leopard throne could be explained by the fact that these undertaking, that those undertaking pursued the Roman period sometimes wear a leopard skin. The privileging of Mark in the Grima Evangelist portraits perhaps of the Church of Alexandria with which the Aksumite Church had its closest ties. The Alexandrian type tholos and the strong Egyptian influence in the portraits raises the issue of the extent to which the Grima Gospels provide a glimpse of lost gospel book elimination from Egypt as well as elsewhere in the Mediterranean. The gilded covers of Abba Grima I might possibly be its original covers, i.e. of AD 530-660, the cross of the um, vegetal pass, but there is a related example carved in Staka in Kuwait, and a simplified version of this motif is seen in the ceiling coffers of the Ethiopian church at Dabra Damo. The embossed silver cover held Abba Grima III and II in recent years until Abba Grima II was removed in 2006 repairs and left with no cover at all, which is apparently still the case. That this cover was made in Ethiopia is suggested by the circled Gitter's letter we recognized on it. It was not made for Abba Grima II or III because it is too small for the pages. The amount of wear on the lower corners of um, Abba Grima I covers indicates that the gospel book was in use for a very long time before being stored to get again be enjoyed more recently. The Grima monastery monks view the Grima gospels as sacred relics like the Augustine gospels in the UK, with a reputation as the gospels copied by Abba Grima, one of the legendary uh, nine saints who helped found the Ethiopian church. According to legend, God stopped the sun so that Abba Grima could complete his work in a single day. The Grima Gospels' religious significance, as well as their irreplaceable historical um, value, should be kept in mind when there are um, when there's perhaps suggestions of displaying them to tourists in insecure museums outside the monastery, exposed daily uh, light. So. This brings me to the final um, section of the talk, um, and basically I want to share our experiences for the past good few years. Um, so there was an Ethiopian conference in November 2013 where the revealing of the carbon dating of the um, Abba Grima Gospels um, took place and um, uh, subsequently um, we decided to have um, public engagement activities um, surrounding the, the photographs of these Gospels. Um, little did we know that um, it was going to lead to, well, um, at least six years worth of um, public engagement activities here in the UK and abroad. So basically what I want to share is some of the experiences and the learnings from engaging the public with the Grima Gospels through two photo exhibitions and related events. In Amsterdam University's Alad Pison Museum, the photo exhibition of a selected uh, illuminated pages ran from November 2015 to March 2016. You can see the simple way the pages were mounted. Um, and this um, exhibition was visited by over 12,000 people. It was also accompanied by a colloquium. And then in Oxford um, at the time, I was still there. Uh, the exhibition in Oxford's Classic Centre included all of the illuminated Garima um, pages around the walls of the, um, the outreach room with um, Comprada on posters in adjoining entry hall. The um, exhibition ran from November 2015 to July 2017. And um, despite <laughs> the, the, the room being used constantly for teaching for part of each day, a total of um, around a thousand visitors um, came, most of whom had no previous knowledge of the Grima Gospels or Ethiopian art, but came to look because their interest was aroused by the Grima images in the window facing the street, which has a high footfall, if you know St. Giles in, uh, in uh, Oxford. The key point, we found is that the public were very happy to view photographs of the illuminated pages without complaining that they were not the originals. 
displaying photographs also has advantages, <laughs> other advantages. Um, you can display all of the illuminated openings for view elements of security or insurance, um, and you can run a display for much longer when fading is not an issue. It is also cheap to mount, um, so you can make admission free of charge. So um, the exercise itself revealed the enormous interest in Ethiopian and Eritrean Christian culture, including among those who who've, had never come across it before. Um, we have obviously Professor Michael Gervis, um, generosity of his photographs and the monks to thank for all of this, without which none of it would have happened. Um, the, there was a further exhibition, uh, just waiting for it to upload. The, this was a study day um, accompanied by a colloquium for the public and colleagues, which was full. Um, that event led to a further related study day focused on the public along with the Bodleian Library, exhibiting two of its illuminated um, Gittes manuscripts. And much of the audience came from London, um, parts of uh, uh, South Wales, um, there were some from Swindon, um, and so forth. Uh, that event led us to being approached by members of the UK, Ethiopian and Eritrean communities who were keen to see more of the Bodleian Library's major collection of Gittes manuscripts. And at the um, Bodleian, we organized a follow-up workshop with um, the curators and um, academics. Um, and they were delighted to have the opportunity to work with the local communities from whom they knew they could learn, as we um, shall see here. And then in the summer of 2018, uh, there was an exhibition which highlighted um, the Gittes manuscripts in the Bodleian. Now these are much later dated rather than the dating of the Grima Gospels. Um, and the exhibition was accompanied by an introductory catalogue, a colloquium, an activity day, um, all organised in collaboration with the local Ethiopian and Eritrean communities. So this then led to um, a co-curated uh, display. So this is the first time that the Bodleian Libraries worked with communities to co-curate um, a display in their, um, in their library. So uh, what the communities most wanted from these events was that people, especially young uh, members of their own UK communities, um, come away with an impression of the importance of the role of uh, the Gittes language and not be daunted to learn it. Um, and that, you know, displaying this heritage in settings such as Oxford University conveys its importance and value while also helping to make that setting feel more accessible. And we were visited, um, this was a bit of a surprise for me, that we were visited by um, the Ethiopian ambassador to the UK who was visiting uh, Oxford at that time, and we worked with the development office um, to for him to see the the uh, the display. Um, our colleagues in the Ashmole Museum coin rooms have included Mark's portrait from the Grima Gospels in their exhibition of the Axumite coins, which was part of the Imagining the Divine exhibition, um, which took place in late uh, 2017, um, with lots of classical colleagues, including Mary Beard. Um, the catalogue of the Ashmole collection of the Axumite coins, um, many bequeathed by um, Joel Jensen, has recently appeared with excellent colour illustrations. And um, this is just giving you some thoughts about what some of the community members thought about working with um, the Bodleian Libraries and the Classics Department over the last um, well, couple of years um, prior to the co-curated um, display. And this is where I stop, I think. Um, so thank you for your time today. I just wanted to give you a bit of an idea of where you can get um, further information. Um, Helen mentioned the uh, classical languages one, which might not be related to the Grima Gospels and Le Antiquity. Um, however, it does talk about, um, you know, sort of taking classics to the communities in different settings across the globe. and. Um, after the uh, 2018 exhibition and so forth, the subsequent events, there was the um, uh, collected um, catalogue of the 
um, treasures of Ethiopian and Eritrean manuscripts in the Bodleian libraries. Um, you can also order the Garuma Gospels from any good um, bookshops, uh, which will give you further information about the Garuma Gospels specifically. So I'm just going to stop sharing. Um, uh, and just in case you might want to, who knows, um, if you want to know a bit more about the Giz language, sorry, I'm just going to This is just purely for your um, enjoyment as those who are learning. I'll, I'll see if I can put it in the chat, in the chat, actually. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll see if I can put it in the chat. Um, but that, that just gives you the background in how uh, the Gitter's language fits in, in, I suppose, the global languages. So it's part of the Semitic languages. Um, and uh, these are normally divided into North, um, Central and South and um, Git is, is um, part of the uh, Southern Semitic languages. Thank you very much indeed, May, that's fabulous. Um, we've got some people commenting in the, in the chat already to say thank you, how interesting and informative um, that was, and I'm just bowled over by how beautiful those those paintings are. Absolutely stunning. Um, thank you so much, May. Um, are you happy enough to answer a couple of questions? Yes, sure. Yeah. As much we've, as I can. <laughs> we've got one in the in the chat already. If anyone has questions, um, if they drop them into the chat, let me see. Uh, so Matthew is asking, how can we reconcile the sanctity of the original gospels? Obviously the monastic community of feelings about who should see them with photographic or digital copies. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think somebody answered that in back to um, the holy book, the Quran. Um, yeah. where you can still read on Kindle, you can still read the Holy Bible on, you know, uh, different formats. Uh, I suppose, you know, as long as you've got, um, because these, uh, particularly the Grima Gospels were from the monastery, you couldn't take them away, um, because that would be sacrilegious. Um, but you can take photos of them because of the, the monks agreed to that. So in, in a sense, if it was <laughs> sanctified by the monks, um, then it's fine. Um, and so, you know, we do have quite a lot of holy scriptures um, in, a, in a digital form and many. Um, so when we were working with the communities, um, one of the community leaders was um, an Orthodox priest and his congregation. Um, from the, the Battersea Bat um, uh, Orthodox uh, Church. And so we basically tried as much as we can to honour and respect um, the, the books uh, as holy relics and the importance that they presented to the Ethiopian Eritrean community, um, as much as trying to learn from them as researchers as well. So the there was this mutual, um, shall we say, knowledge exchange um, taking place where the researchers were, were actually learning uh, in depth, um, you know, sort of perspective about these um, gospels um, as much as the sort of um, the contemporary rituals that take place um, in, if you go to a modern church now in, in London or elsewhere, um, the Gitter's language is still um, spoken in respect to the rituals and service um, and the, the sort of scriptures are, you know, very um, sacred and, you know, sort of there's lots of um, respect for them. Um, so, in, in a sense, we're, you know, sort of balancing the kind of academic output with the community interests. As, and these were all, you know, that it was given freely in a sense, you know, these access was given freely. So, yeah, <laughs> I think that's a slightly long-winded way of answering. 
Um, thank you. There's a, a couple of questions from Simon and Steve that sort of um, tie in together. Simon's asking, can you tell us um, a bit about the script used to write the Gaiz language? And Steve is asking, does the translation reflect what text it was based on? And he says, for example, does Mark have the longer or shorter ending? Ah, well, that I do not know. Um, uh, in terms of the script, so the script will be um, Gitters, which is, as I said, um, somatic. Um, and Gitters is, can be considered the um, precursor to modern Amharic and Tigrinya, um, which are spoken in um, Ethiopia and um, Eritrea, in modern Ethiopian Eritrea, and those are closely connected to um, South Arabian um, scripts. Um, when there was an Armenian exhibition at the Bodleian Libraries many moons ago, um, I was very surprised to see the similarities between Armenian script um, and um, the Ethiopic um, Gitter script as well. So the, in a sense, they, they they, they do share some commonalities and particularly in Yemen as well, um, there, are, there are some connections there too. Uh, what is the significance of the peacock? Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> uh, I think you're absolutely right. Um, do you know, I might have to come back to that. I, 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 I'm just trying to think, I mean, I was born in Eritrea and um, obviously went to Ethiopia just to try and think of um, peacocks in the idea of the Garden of Eden in this kind of flamboyant sort of representation of the flourishing um, Garden of Eden. So I suppose if thinking about it in that way, um, it's the, the books themselves are, I suppose, illustrating um, the Garden of Eden, um, which you know, some people believed it was in Ethiopia. Thank you. And Leila is asking um, if you can read, so are Ge'ez and Armenian similar, like Arabic and Urdu? Can you read one if you know the other? No. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> um, there are many people have tried um they are similar in respect that there must be at some distant path very distant path um the convergence you know of two societies merging and um uh, the, that cultural exchange but you wouldn't be able to look at um Gitters and be able to read army that, that's not quite what I was saying in terms of similarities. Uh, it was more about the kind of, um, you can see some time long ago, um, they have been borrowings of each other, you know, like for example, um, in, in Tigrinya, which is the, uh, the modern sort of, um, I suppose, sister language of Giz, um, you will have lots of words which are Arabic, um, but there will be, slightly different sounds and they would of course be written differently um but in a in a sense you can see that there has been some sort of language cultural exchanges in the past for that to happen thank you very much um may i don't know if there are any other questions i think we've exhausted everything on the chat um so I'm, I'm just going to say on behalf of everyone, thank you. Trisha says, thank you for showing us their wonderful manuscripts. Oh, I would like to know about what the underlying text is. I'm not sure. Which underlining text was that? I don't know. That's from Trisha. Is Trisha there? Not sure, okay. Uh, the Greek one. <laughs> the Greek oh, right, yeah. What, what, what is the Greek text that they were translated from? So these will be the. Um, so, the Greek, the Gospels written in Greek, 
and then that being translated into Gittes. So they're copying from the original Greek uh, gospels. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is super. Thank you so much, May. Um, we can't really, you know, give a round of applause. I think there's there's an icon that we can we can do. But thank you so much on behalf of everyone here. Oh, look at all those little hands. That's brilliant. Okay, everyone's applauding. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, May, for taking the time to um, to share that that really fascinating talk with us about these texts. No thank problem. You very much. That's all right. That's super. And thank you, everybody, for joining in. Um, and we'll leave it there for today. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much, May. Do you want to make me host again? Oh, here, I'm still recording. Absolutely. Um...